The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. A proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina, I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, we're going to pick up our discussion on U.S.-China-Africa relations in part because of the fluidity of the situation in Washington right now. We just don't really know what's going to happen, and there's been a lot of talk in Africa about the expectations and the hopes for an incoming Biden administration and what they'll do. Last week, if you recall, we spoke with Joshua Eisenman, professor at University of Notre Dame, and he gave us a Chinese perspective on what this would be. And we have reached out, by the way, to four Chinese professors and analysts. And I just want to let everybody know that we have either been ignored or turned down. So we're probably not going to get the Chinese perspective on this, given the sensitivities of the U.S.-China relationship today. But today, what we're going to do is bring everybody to Washington and get the perspective from inside the Beltway. Kobus, before we get to our discussion though, about U.S.-China-Africa relations, I think it's important that we update everybody on what's been going on in Zambia. It's been a dramatic past 72 hours. Over the weekend, Zambia became the first African country this year to default on a portion of its debt in when it failed to pay a $42.5 million bond payment on $3 billion of euro bond holdings. It officially went into default. Then on Monday, they started pointing fingers at each other. The Zambia External Bondholder Committee re, you know, lashed out at the government in a statement and said the committee has no basis to conclude that the authorities intend to treat bondholders on an equitable basis with other commercial and non-concessional lenders. Basically throwing down the gauntlet saying that the government has not provided the transparency or the access to Chinese loan data. The bondholder committee was also frustrated that the Zambian government did not enter into an IMF debt restructuring program, which by the way, the IMF now is in talks with Zambia. At the same time, the finance ministry in Lusaka, boy, they fired back. And the finance minister in a statement with Bloomberg said, if I pay the bondholders, the moment I pay them, the other creditors are going to put the dynamite under my legs and blow off my legs. I'm gone. I can't walk anymore. If I don't pay the bondholders, my legs will remain intact. But I'll probably have a shot in the arm and I'll be bleeding in the arm but I can still walk. That is from the finance ministry. So you can see it's getting very acrimonious right now. One other very quick point for us to talk about. There was also progress on the Chinese debt angle in Zambia today. We got word that uh, Zambia negotiated a debt deferral deal with the China Exim Bank for $110 million, where interest and principal will be deferred on loans that were to come due between May next year and the end of 2021. Now, $110 million is a good start, but when you think about the total Chinese loan portfolio in Zambia at about 4 to $5 billion, it's rather insignificant. So, Kobus, a lot going on in Zambia, really an important milestone this weekend with the default and the acrimonious relationship between bondholders, the Chinese, and the Zambian government. What's your take on what's happened? Well, in the first place, I hope it, it raises, you know, it, it gives us a chance for, for more conversations about the role of, of bondholders and other kind of private creditors in the current African debt crisis. In the second place, I <laughs> I was laughing at um, at this this detail that apparently the the Zambian government would offer them the full details of the Chinese loan portfolio if they would then sign a non disclosure agreement, which they then rejected. So I, I you know I had to wonder like what are they hiding? It's it's really it's it's it, it, you know the fact the fact of the secrecy I think you know can makes everything a lot more tantalizing. And then in the final, you know, related in the final place, kind of relating to that issue, is um, you know I, I I argued in a in a newsletter intro um, to our subscribers um, last week that that I think what what is really needed is for the African Union to um, to set up basically a, a database of all all public loans um, to African governments, you know, kind of, and that they should that they should be preemptive and go for full transparency. 
democracy uh, and really kind of you know kind of make that the cornerstone of of future debt dealings you know kind of on the back of this current disaster um i i don't have much hope that that will actually happen but i think that is what they should do well, let's get perspectives on what's going on in Zambia, but more importantly, also the situation with the U.S.-China-Africa relationship. And we're thrilled to have back on the show two of the best experts out there on this. Aubrey Ruby is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council in Washington. She is uh, a longtime friend of the show. A very good morning to you, Aubrey. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And we're also thrilled to have back on the program Landre Signé, who is a senior fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program and the African Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institution. A very good morning, Landre. Good morning, and thank you very much for having me. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for getting up so early to join us. Aubrey, let's start with you. And Landre, I'd like to get your take on this as well. Before we get into the geopolitics and the international relations portion of our discussion, can you give us your assessment of how you saw the events in Zambia unfold and what significance you attach to it? Sure. I think it um, it concerns a lot of people that this is not going to be an isolated event. Um, that there are several other countries that are struggling with uh, paying their loans, including Chad and Congo and Angola. And so I do think there are many who are afraid of kind of a domino effect of uh, the Zambian default, um, but also can recognize that there were some uh, specific factors to Zambia, the populist government, for example, that was elected, uh, that isn't thinking as as clearly perhaps on macroeconomic policy as uh, as others would be in terms of how do you address the difference between private debt holders and public debt holders. You know, their view that they needed to be treated equally um, is not usually the way that folks think about uh, dealing with Eurobond uh, creditors versus as bilateral, because the bilateral negotiating mechanisms are much stronger and easier than it is when you have a committee of bondholders. So uh, overall, I think it's a troubling development uh, that the calls for transparency around Chinese lending will become even uh, more intensified and that you will find that uh, other countries are watching closely. Shifting to the the um, American election um, and the the the, um, the rise of the the or the coming Biden administration, I saw a lot of analysts, um, t- you know, t- discussing the tone, the change of tone from the Trump era to the Biden era. You know that obviously Trump was was notorious for for being very blunt. You know, for for calling Africa and Africa shithole countries. You know, though. So I wanted to ask both of you: um, Do you th- do you foresee a, a a change in substance in in you know kind of in the way that the Biden administration will deal will deal with Africa, or is it, or are you mostly looking out for to, for a change in tone and optics? So uh, certainly there will be a change in tone and there will be a change in orientation. Um, This administration, the Biden administration coming in has already said and indicated uh, that they will be much more multilateral in their thinking and prefer engaging internationally with uh, big organizations like the WTO, like WHO. Um, and those those organizations, as we know, are dominated by uh, African countries in terms of number of votes. Uh, African countries have the largest number of votes in, in all of the international organizations, including the UN. Um, and so you will see a multilateralism, which is different than the way the Trump administration came in with a bilateral approach. Uh, but there has been historically incredible continuity in Africa policy. You know, it has been non-controversial. It has been bipartisan and what I would consider big tent, meaning they bring a lot of different players under the same tent. And even Trump kept Obama's policies on um, on Africa or his programs, uh, including the Young African Leaders programs and Power Africa. Um, I think another difference the Biden administration will have is is who will be making the policies. There's already a big effort with the transition team and the open uh, calls for for new people to join the administration that for for a more diverse group of people. Uh, so I expect a lot more uh, African diaspora to work in the administration, uh, African Americans to work in the administration. And I think many of them will choose, not all, but many of them will choose to work on Africa policy. And that will change the faces making Africa policy. 
Um, and so I think you're going to have a change in to- tone, a change in the people guiding it, and then a multilateral orientation. Landre, in your role at the Brookings Institution, you have an opportunity to come on and interact with a lot of senior level U.S. policymakers. A lot of those people over the past four or five years have been very focused on China and China's role in Africa. Do you think that in the new Biden administration that there will be the same focus on the Chinese or will they start to listen to what African stakeholders are saying and migrate U.S. policy more towards African needs and less towards what the Chinese are doing on the continent? This is a very important question. I think that, uh, broadly speaking, first, uh, the implications of a Biden uh, presidency in uh, U.S.-Africa relations and in extension also uh, in the competition between the United States and China in Africa. So I think first and foremost, under the uh, Biden presidency, the tone when engaging with African leaders or speaking uh, about Africa, and I think as pointed out as well with Aubrey, by Aubrey, uh, will most likely be more diplomatic and respectful uh, compared uh, to uh, what we have seen uh, with the, the current president. So a friendlier tone is really important uh, to advance uh, U.S. Uh, strategic uh, interests. And when we speak about tone, we also speak about this narrative of uh, competition between uh, the U.S. and uh, China uh, in Africa. So I think they will perhaps be uh, less uh, aggressive, if I can say it that way. However, they will still refer to China. I don't think that the China question will be uh, out of the equation uh, with a um, Biden administration. So the second point also uh, is that I, I will expect the Biden presidency to be uh, much more involved uh, in uh, multilateralism, but not just uh, from a global perspective, but also by supporting initiatives such as the African Continental Free Trade uh, Area or the African uh, Union Development Agencies, uh, among uh, other uh, factors. So we'll have to clearly monitor very closely uh, the post-AGOA uh, uh, configuration. So a third point uh, is uh, related to the notions of value. So I think that many of the policies that the Biden administration uh, will engage will probably be aligned with uh, what African publics uh, value, such as uh, democracy, uh, the rule of law, among other. So at least a Biden administration will be more vocal uh, about uh, those uh, questions uh, compared to the uh, current uh, administration, asking for more accountability uh, from African uh, government. So a a fifth point is also that although uh, traditionally uh, people have perceived Republican as being more involved in trade investment. I think that a, Bi- the, a Biden presidency will uh, probably uh, offer platforms for uh, U.S. and African uh, investors to engage and therefore create mutual uh, prosperity. So uh, align with what uh, the uh, Clinton, Bush, or Obama administration did, and probably going further than what uh, uh, Trump uh, has been uh, doing uh, as well, because from uh, a, in the Trump uh, case, um, although the policy or the configuration was looking very uh, attractive, on the other hand, the implementation and the uh, space for engagement uh, has been uh, reduced. We, we want to highlight at least Prosper Africa, uh, which w- has been a, a, a good development. And a final uh, consideration, and I think uh, is related to diaspora, uh, by the, uh, the Biden uh, uh, administration will also be uh, more likely to involve the diaspora at a much higher level than uh, we have seen uh, in the past. And even during the campaign, uh, he had a, a statement uh, about the diaspora, the, the African diaspora, which is a, an original development compared to what uh, have been done uh, thus far by uh, during other uh, electoral campaigns. So 
will, we should not forget, however, that ultimately a Biden presidency will first uh, advance U.S. Uh, interests, uh, whether around the world or in Africa. But uh, I think those will probably be more aligned with uh, African interests. So we will have a higher convergence, although on some issues we'll also see dissensus. Aubrey, um, over the last while, as I've been reading, you know, African reactions to to the election, I've I've seen two themes. One is a, a general kind of criticism of the securitization of U.S. engagement in Africa, um, and the, the the general kind of focus on on anti terrorism and and peacekeeping and so on. That you know, over things like trade and development. But on the other hand, also alarm that the the Trump administration is planning to to withdraw troops, particularly from from Somalia, ahead of elections and ahead of um, and you know kind of in in the context of grow, growing tensions in Ethiopia um how do you see the issue this issue of of securitization and the, the presence of US military in Africa um, under Biden again I think the Biden administration will be willing to engage more and so while the Trump administration has been pulling back in so many ways, I heard even this morning that uh, they're speeding up the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, for example, even in this lame duck period. And it's been the same. They've been withdrawing uh, the footprint and, and scaling it down in African markets. Um, I think that has alarmed many African partners. And so I do think the Biden administration will be more willing to engage on not only the uh, security front, but also things around democratization and support for democratization on the continent. And it's also, let's note out that the uh, Wall Street Journal has been reporting the Pentagon is considering downgrading the defense attache role in a number of West African embassies. This has sparked a, a pretty passionate response on Capitol Hill and other places in Washington. Uh, Larry Hanauer, who's formerly at RAND and formerly a defense attache in Senegal, he's been a, a close follower of China-Africa relations, and he wrote on the Defense One blog today, the presence of highly ranked attaches in such countries also helps ensure that the U.S. perspectives are heard above the din. When Russia, China, and Iran have flag rank attaches in capitals, where the United States is represented by a field-grade officer, our adversaries gain greater high-level access to our strategic partners. So the logic of downgrading the attaches and redeploying troops so that they can confront China and other parts of the world, when in fact those troops and the the, the attaches are there actually to also monitor China, when what they're doing in Africa just seems rather ironic. Landre, you talk about a return to values-based foreign policy, and I... I'm kind of interested in that in part because this is a very sharp contrast with the Chinese. The Chinese do not approach it with a values-based approach. So this would be a this is going back to the way that the US was. But given the fact that we are in the midst right now of a constitutional or democratic crisis in the United States where the election is not being certified, we have just come out of an election where there has been active voter suppression of African Americans and other minorities. And I'm just wondering, is the United States really in a position today to return to a value-based foreign policy when, in fact, that it's got a significant number of difficulties at home? And if you don't represent those values at home, how do you then represent them in a place like Tanzania, where there were clear problems with their election, and all President Magufuli has to do is turn around and say, you're criticizing me about my election? Look at your election. So I'm wondering... Is that really feasible in the next year or two to, to see a return to this kind of governance types of issues when, in fact, we are not really the house on the hill that we think we are? So this is a, another very important question. I think we should not forget that uh, when we speak about democracy, we speak about different levels of uh, uh, accountability, uh, the personal accountability, so the accountability uh, from a direct leader, for example, the pure accountability, the one which is related uh, uh, to the team of uh, this given leader. So, uh, so for example, in the case of Trump, the personal accountability from Trump, his personal commitment to democracy or not, uh, the one of his team as pure one. But we also have the vertical accountability uh, represented by vote, the electoral uh, process. And... Um, Although uh, the current uh, incumbent has uh, 
try to discredit the uh, vertical uh, accountability or elections. On the other hand, a good characteristic of democracies is uh, horizontal accountability, which includes checks and balances. And in this specific uh, context, uh, I think that uh, the uh, what we can what we see in uh, America is a clear illustration of a functioning democracy because in a functioning democracy you can a functioning democracy could be under stress you have that's why we speak about the quality of democracy it's not either you have it or you don't you have different uh, levels uh, uh, and uh, if one of the mechanism doesn't work uh, the ability of the other uh, mechanism of uh, uh, accountability should work. And in this specific case, uh, I think that uh, by uh, in January, uh, and based on the evidence provided thus far, uh, the United States would see a new president. And I am a little bit uh, discomforted by the comparison because if this was an authoritarian country, we will not be even discussing now about who is the winner. So uh, what, uh, the, the incumbent who have simply declared um, himself or herself uh, as a winner of the election, but uh, and kept and remain in power and jail the opponent. But in the case of the United States, it is clear that if a candidate is, uh, doesn't have a high standard of personal accountability, we still have vertical accountability, which is the electoral process, uh, which overall went well, and I think the elections were uh, are meaningful, so they were free, fair, uh, uh, but also uh, credible and meaningful, which means that independently of the problem uh, which could have uh, evolved, uh, they may not be of nature of putting into question the final outcome of course, uh, let's uh, wait the final certification uh, in uh, December uh, to, to, to be certain about the final outcome. But the evidence thus far is demonstrating that despite personal preference of uh, the personal preference of the incumbent, uh, it is likely to have a new, uh, it is almost certain to have a new president uh, uh, in uh, January. And using this argument, uh, the signal sent to African emerging democracies that the quality of leadership matter, but if the leader fail, the quality of institutions uh, uh, is also extremely uh, important because they will allow uh, democracies uh, to uh, survive uh, in case uh, when uh, challenges when facing challenges, and uh, ultimately the quality of democracy is also important including in established uh, democracies. So it's not, um, so it is not uh, the, the perception that because a country has been democratic for centuries, that they, sh they should not continue to improve uh, the, the democratic development. So no, it is, democracy it is a constant uh, struggle. So uh, citizens have to remain involved, which bring to the final level of accountability, the diagonal accountability, which is the role of uh, citizen engagement and the media helping to reinforce the other levels of accountability. Aubrey, the you know to which extent do you when you look at um, at or we, when you when you th when you project ahead and uh, about what kind of approach the Biden administration will have uh, to Africa, to which extent do you, do you foresee it to be a continuation of the Obama approach, and to which extent do you do you see differences? I mean, what what do you think the Obama administration did wrong in Africa that the that the Biden administration can improve on? Well, I do think there's a lot of things uh, about this potential Biden administration that will be a continuation of a, an Obama approach. And that's just not on Africa policy, but on a lot of other areas of, of economic policy in the U.S. and, and social agenda. Um, and even some of the same people will come back. Um, I think that the thing that the Trump administration did well, that maybe Obama didn't quite do well, which was is really institutionalize a commercial approach towards Africa. Um, you know, under the Trump administration, we did get the uh, Development Finance Corporation, and that was a result of the Build Act, and that gave firepower to commercial um, commercial support. 
uh, for U.S. companies operating in African markets. Remember, during the Obama administration, XM at U.S. XM Bank was basically um, uh, paralyzed and couldn't do deals, and they were unable to uh, resurrect it. And it really took the kind of, I guess, fear of China. Uh, to bring back Exxon Bank and push forth the um, Build Act, so the commercial policy really came to uh, to bear in the Trump administration, and I don't think we've actually gotten to see the full value of it yet. Because remember, the the DFC just became operational two three months before COVID lockdown, um, and so we haven't really seen the full value of those uh, pieces. But I did want to comment on your last point about um, about democracy and and you know pushing and and can you do that at a high ground to stand on and you know my hope is that this administration takes a position of humility um and really has an awareness of that and doesn't have a finger wagging approach you know it reminds me of the henry kissinger you know quote about the kind of dual myth of american foreign policy that on the left um that you know many see the u.s as the ultimate arbiter of domestic evolutions all over the world and on the right, many see the U.S. as, you know, that the world's ills can be basically cured by American hegemony. And I think both of those um, myths or uh, extreme approaches are wrong and that we need to essentially approach the situation in African markets as recognizing the changing realities on the ground, that African countries have more choice than they ever have had before in terms of global partners. And that, um, and in that choice, you know, we need to think of them as with respect and dignity in, in exercising their freedom of choice. And that to make a choice towards the U.S., we need to make, you know, clear reasons to do that. And those reasons can be U.S. soft power and people to people ties. Those reasons can be commercial aligned interest. Um, those reasons can be global collaboration on global issues. So, you know, I think we need to kind of tamp down the typical American arrogance that can result in foreign policy and find a way forward that is one of, um, of tempered, you know, humility. Well, that's a good segue into our, our, our my closing question for you, and it, it relates to an essay that was written uh, today by our good friend Jude Moore, who is the senior policy fellow at the Center for Global Development, also in Washington with you. And he published a column in African Business Magazine, very, very provocative, where he basically says we are seeing about to embark on the coming decade of Chinese dominance on the continent. And he looks at Europe uh, and the U.S., And he says about the U.S., and I'm quoting here, beyond stern rhetoric and speeches, the U.S. will not offer an alternative in Africa. The continent has never ranked high for U.S. foreign policy, and that is not about to change. Okay. then in Europe, he says Europe will not compete with China in Africa since Europe has never demonstrated real interest in African prosperity. In 2018, the then EU president, Jean-Claude Juncker, described Europe's relationship with Africa as, quote, beyond inadequate and humiliatingly so. Then he writes about China. He says, as the world divides, Beijing will turn to the region in which its power and influence are growing and where it faces no peer competitor, Africa. So with that in mind, I'd like to get your kind of sense in your reflection on Jude's statements there. It's a it's a big picture kind of look, but I think that's a great way for us to wrap up our discussion. Landre, let's start with you about do you think and agree with Jude that we're about to embark on a coming decade of Chinese dominance on the continent, as Jude says? The first point that I, I, I want to highlight is that uh, Africa will be ruled by African. Uh, so it's extremely important not to forget the African agencies in this process. So uh, I, I want us to be very prudent. Uh, and, and even when allying, whether with China, the US, Europe, uh, or other players, uh, we still have an African agencies. African leaders, at least most African leaders, make uh, choices. They have a room uh, for maneuver, even when it doesn't look like it. So, and I think the, 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 the Zambian uh, case also showed that uh, 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 African leader can respect or not their commitments uh, with partners. 
So this is the first point. The second point I also want to uh, highlight and connect it with uh, the U.S. foreign policy or, U or foreign policies in general. Jen Thompson, for example, identified four drivers. Uh, and I think this is also connected to a point that Audrey made earlier. So uh, power, peace, principle, prosperity. So they could be uh, summarized as part of the four key drivers of the uh, of foreign policies in general, or the U.S. one in particular, or, or foreign policy of great powers uh, in uh, in particular. So, in it is rare to have those four drivers align. So we we'll usually have a convergence, a couple of them. Sometimes they may be a power and principle, other time prosperity and principle, uh, and that is when. Uh, in an ideal scenario, all the four drivers should be aligned for a given foreign policy. But we, uh, but usually we just have a convergence of two to three of those uh, 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 drivers. And in a case of dissensus, so when there's really no alignment, that is also uh, 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 cases where either a policy will not be decided uh, or uh, they may not be uh, highly effective. So I want to bring those two factors to uh, and connect them with some of the arguments uh, made by our friends to say that the countries which will be more present on, on the continent, the foreign partners who will be more present on the continent, are the one for uh, which those four Ps will be the best aligned. For now, it is true that China, whether we speak about power, peace, principle of prosperity, they are quite aligned. You have a convergence, a, a very good alignment, which explains why uh, China, uh, uh, China's presence in Africa uh, has grown uh, at a faster uh, speed uh, than uh, most of the uh, uh, other uh, partners, uh, or at least uh, compared to the established partners. But having said that, I think we should, when speaking about Africa, when speaking about African countries, we should not forget that they have agencies and uh, we should also take into consideration uh, the fact that other players are, are, are evolving, not only China, we have uh, 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 other players, even if they are not as prominent, uh, uh, such as India, such as uh, countries in the Middle East, uh, in, in Latin America, we, we have Brazil, uh, for example, and we also have a renewed uh, interest uh, of uh, established uh, uh, partner. And, and I think, Eric, you, you mentioned before, uh, also, uh, the U.S. and especially when adopting the the, the Africa uh, strategy, we saw the reaction of uh, Bolton comparing uh, China, uh, Russia uh, to uh, uh, countries which are having a, a disruptive uh, impact uh, on the continent. So, to make it, uh, uh, the, the, my short answer to that is: Africa will be ruled by African. And Africans will be welcoming most of the partners who respect their priorities. And in a piece that uh, we co-published with my friends from Afrobarometer, uh, some of those priorities that Africans uh, want to advance, uh, or, or at least to solve, uh, challenges that they want to solve include unemployment, health, infrastructure, education, water supply, crime and security, and, and finally poverty uh, and uh, destitution. So that those are some of the top priorities that Africans uh, want to address. And I think no matter which partner will be involved in providing tangible solutions uh, to those priorities. African citizens will welcome them and, uh, and African government will also be likely to collaborate uh, with them. And having said that, we also have the uh, accountable governance dimension, uh, the state effectiveness dimension uh, with a majority of African interested in advancing democracy. Although African leaders uh, may or not have the same position, uh, it is clear that this provides an opportunities for for players, especially Western players, uh, to act in a way which may be more aligned with what the African publics want, which may or not be aligned with what some African leaders want, depending on if those countries are democratic or not. 
Andre, we know we know that you have to go and you have a very busy schedule and we're very, very grateful that you took time out of your schedule to join us. Uh, just everybody, Landre Signier is the senior fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program and the African Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institution. We're going to say goodbye to Landre, but keep our discussion going with Aubrey. But before we go, Landre, can you just give us a quick uh, shout out as to what your Twitter handle is if people want to follow what you're reading and writing these days? Oh, thank you very much. It's uh, just uh, Landry Singh, my Twitter handle. Great. Well, we'll put a link to Landry's Twitter in the show notes and also some, some links to some of the recent writing that he's done for the Brookings Institution. Landry, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Eric, and have a marvelous uh, day. Aubrey, we're going to continue the conversation with you. Let's go ahead and get your feedback on Jude's article. What did you think of the points that he was making and whether or not we are embarking, in fact, on a coming decade of Chinese dominance on, on the continent? Well, what I thought was very interesting about the piece uh, is that it, he mentions that China will turn to African markets uh, because doors are closing to China in other regions. And so it's basically an elevation of African uh, countries and opportunities by default in many ways, especially with the kind of Western push around uh, anti-Huawei and anti-ZTE and the telecom equipment and the world being divided into kind of tech, uh, tech standard zones and the U.S. and Europe uh, taking part in that effort. And so I thought that was a very interesting point that, you know, with increasing tensions with uh, between China and India, that Africa will be kind of by default an area that China looks uh, more to. Um, overall, I think the competition um, for, for particular Afri access to African strategic resources when it comes to minerals will intensify as many countries in the world try to reshape their supply chains. The COVID crisis taught many companies um, the, the problem with being over-dependent on China as a manufacturing and processing uh, market. And so, it, you know, many countries are looking to reshape their supply chains. France has mentioned it, UK, uh, the Japanese have a $2 billion fund that is to bring supply chains back uh, to Japan and out of China. Uh, and I think the U.S. will look at that, too. There, there, there are bills going through Congress right now about strategic minerals. And the U.S. DFC has invested in a company, recently invested $25 million in equity in a company that is doing uh, strategic minerals for supply chains like lithium batteries all over the world, including in Africa. Um, and so I think you'll see a lot more uh, activity. And then again, as I said earlier, that African countries will have their choice of partners. Aubrey, how do you see trade developing, um, you know, during the Biden era? Um, we, we, we saw the, the negotiation of a bilateral deal with, with Kenya. Um, and at the, obviously, at the same time, the, the continental free trade agreement is, is slowly moving ahead. Um, how, how do you see the US engaging with the free trade area? And then also, like, what, what is the future of these kind of bilateral trade deals? I mean, first and foremost, we have to return trade to a pre-COVID level. Um, you know, trade has dramatically decreased during this period, uh, according to WTO or WEF forecasts. Uh, I've seen anything between trade being down by by 15 to 25 percent in 2020. And that's just the first half. So we haven't seen the second half numbers. Um, additionally, you know, global FDI is down uh, about 50 percent in the first half of this year and 30 percent into African markets down, um, according to UNCTAD. So I think first on the trade front, a Biden administration. Administration, um, as with many countries in the world, will have to figure out how to, to rebound trade to, to pre-COVID levels. Um, and I do think uh, Jude has recently written another piece about the African Continental Free Trade Agreement in Foreign Policy magazine, along with the former Minister of Trade of Botswana. Um, and they talked about the importance of engaging with the, with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the Secretariat. I do think the Biden administration will engage with um, with AFCCFA, and then the on the the, the Kenyan free trade agreement. Um, I'm not sure how they're going to square this circle, but I don't think they're going to throw out the the progress that's been made with the Kenyans over the past year on a potential FTA. 
Um, and we have to remember that even during the Biden administration, um, before Trump even was um, a, a, a potential as a president, uh, there was discussions of how to move beyond AGOA and what would be the um, kind of replacement approach to AGOA. And so I don't necessarily think this administration is going to automatically revert to a NAGOA approach. I don't think they're automatically going to reject um, the FTA uh, process with Kenya. Uh, so I think it's going to be a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, but I do think they will engage more readily with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement than the Trump administration did. I'd like to get your take on on, on something because I've been accused of being too negative, too to bearish on Africa, uh, and because the statistics that I look at are are grim and dire. The unemployment rates in South Africa now have crossed 30%. Uh, we did some reporting today on the state-owned enterprises in Kenya, Kenya Airways, Kenya Railways Corporation, uh, and also Kenya Power that are all increasingly insolvent. We have the Zambia debt crisis. I mean, we can look across the continent and look at the economic situation, and it's becoming increasingly dire, not to mention in Ethiopia, where conflict has now broken out. And one has to think about whether or not the United States returning to its Obama policies or values-based policies is the right mix for a continent that, at least economically speaking, is on fire. And the Chinese, say what you will about all the other issues, they're coming with an economic message. They're talking about debt and finance, which is something that obviously they they have a lot of influence on. But there's also quite a bit of trade that's still happening and quite a bit of investment that's going on. China-Africa trade in the first six months of the year uh, was only down 18 percent. Now, that's in that zone. You said 15 to 25 percent. So it, it fits with the what UNCTAD is saying. But nonetheless, we're going to do somewhere around 180, 190 billion dollars of trade between China and Africa this year, which all things being equal is quite good. So the Chinese message focused on economics, to me, seems far more relevant for the current moment that we're in, given what's happening in Africa today. And I don't hear that coming out of the United States. And what is coming out of the United States, like the DFC, is small. I mean, the DFC, with all the wonderful things it's doing, it's talking about deals in the tens of millions and the single millions. It's not talking about deals in, in the billions. Today, the news out of Uganda was the fact that Uganda and the China Exim Bank are negotiating over $2 billion loan for the new standard gauge railway. Whether that comes tr through or not is, I don't know. But that shows you the discrepancy in scale that we're talking about here. I'd like to get your take on whether or not the United States is really coming to the table to, to be able to talk to African stakeholders about the current moment that they're in. Well, Eric, I want to address several of your points. One, the first one you made was about the kind of dire economic challenge uh, that is facing a lot of countries on the continent. And I agree with that. Um, while the health impact of COVID has not been as uh, as terrible as many had predicted prior to COVID or at the beginning of COVID, um, the economic impact has been dramatic. Um, even the Nigerian uh, state kind of statistics show that they expect a contraction of somewhere between three and eight percent this year with um, uh, millions slipping into abject poverty. Um, and you're going to see that across uh, many markets as many people who uh, made a lot of gains economically over the last 10 years uh, slide backwards for the first time in a generation. And so that really is a troubling uh, thing. And then, as I said, the investment flows are down and we're going to need more investment uh, in order to build out of that. Um, and I do think that there is, uh, at least within this Trump administration and hopefully continued in the Biden administration, a greater focus on the commercial piece. In fact, I was uh, speaking this morning on a Concordia Africa summit and the acting administrator for uh, USAID announced a new program that to Prosper Africa is going to put forth, which is a $500 million program to facilitate trade and investment into uh, Africa markets. And that's not just the investment amount, that's the amount of money that they look to aim to facilitate uh, what they hope to be about $5 billion in investment. Now, 
The reason why uh, Chinese um, kind of financing numbers can be so large is that they're financing large infrastructure projects. And we've talked about this in the past. Um, you know, U.S. entities, U.S. companies are not really doing those type of large infrastructure projects uh, that that we did once upon a time um, many years ago. So we're a service-based economy, and that's not necessarily what we bring to the table. But if you do look at like what Google and Facebook are doing in terms of building digital infrastructure when it comes to undersea cables, when you look at what um, Netflix and others are doing in terms of content, I do think there's a role the U.S. is playing, and it might not be in you know the tangible transport infrastructure, which surely Africa needs. It might be in areas that are uh, more intangible and the service sector. So I don't think the U.S. is absent um, uh, it, in this equation by any means. And the last thing I'll say is very positive, which is we have seen increasing resilience in African markets, particularly those that are quite diversified. So I'm thinking here like the Kenyas. And if you look back, even in Nigeria, if you look back to the, remember the commodity price dip in 2015, 2016, when you saw a couple of recessions, you saw a recession in South Africa, you saw a recession in Nigeria, the bounce back was much faster. It wasn't that the continent was losing decades as what happened uh, in the 80s. Um, it was a couple years, but the bounce back was quite quite rapid. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see that same thing, especially from the more diversified economies. Opie, if, if, you know, kind of obviously you, you, um, you speak with African policymakers frequently, um, what kind of advice would you give them to, to best position Africa to, to take advantage of, of coming shifts in the U.S.? Listen, uh, the same advice I, I give to them thinking about their international partners generally, which is, um, you know, look at them as, as a portfolio of partners figure out which partners do which thing best and kind of filter your opportunities and your priorities to match what that partner can do and has the appetite to do. You know, all too often I, I talk to, you know, African um, leaders and, and they will kind of pitch projects in the U.S. where I'm saying that this is not a good match for what American companies uh, bring to the table. And it's better to kind of filter those priorities based on what different countries do well. So if you have mining opportunities, it's probably not the best to bring your mining opportunities to the U.S. We're not a big mining player, whereas like the Canadians and the Australians are very, very competitive and big in mining. So if you're looking for mining investment, doing a roadshow for mining in the U.S. is not the best use of your resources. Um, but looking at, you know, for example, agribusiness, uh, that's something that the U.S. is very competitive in, and especially ag technologies. Yeah, go to Chicago, talk to companies there uh, and try to kind of attract that specific investment. So it's really about thinking of partners as as a portfolio and picking among them based on what they can do best rather than pitching the same list of projects to each partner. Aubrey Ruby is a non-resident senior fellow with the Africa Center at the Atlantic Council, and she's also co-founder of the Africa Experts Network, author of The Next Africa, which you can buy on Amazon, and she's also an active investor in the African startup scene. Very busy, and we're very grateful that you took the time today also to join us. Uh, just like we asked, uh, Landre, what is your Twitter uh, handle so that people can follow what you're reading and writing these days and if they want to get in touch with you? Sure, they can find me at uh, at Aubrey Ruby A U B R E Y H R U B Y on Twitter. Aubrey Ruby, thank you so much for taking the time this morning to join us. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Kobus, it's so refreshing to get the perspective from inside Washington because the nuance that these two bring to the discussion is vastly different than what we hear elsewhere coming out of, say, the State Department, the White House, and other the institutions, if you will. So two, two points here that in some ways may contradict one another. Aubrey's point that don't come to the United States for the same competitive types of jobs that the Chinese are doing, like mining or infrastructure, is very interesting. And that contrasts a little bit with what Landre was talking about in terms of a return to a value-based foreign policy. I think that the United States has an uphill battle rebuilding its credibility on values-based foreign policy, and in part because, this is, and this is an issue that Jude brought up again in his article that we referenced, coming back to 
things like LGBT issues, which while are very popular in the United States, particularly with democratic constituencies, are not at all popular in African countries. And I, so it depends on what values we're talking about here. And if we're talking about democracy, again, I really think that the United States is a hard sell here. This is not really a good time for democracy when, in fact, the United States is struggling with a lot of democratic norms itself. So writing the democratic norms issue is going to be a very important priority. And when we think about what Africa really needs right now, the, a, a return to a strong United States as an impartial mediator, say, in issues like the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, also in uh, you know the, some of the tensions we're seeing in Ethiopia right now as well, some of the border conflicts that have been happening in West Africa and East Africa, that could be a very important role. And that would be a resumption of America's traditional role playing that, that leadership kind of position, which we desperately need right now. But in the great power competition, do you think that the United States, given where we are today, will be able to compete with the Chinese in terms of relevance? Um, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult question. I, I, think, I think one of the issues is where the U.S.'s relevance lies, right? Um, and, and there I tend to think that, that frequently a, a lot of American power lies in its larger its larger example in the world. So, for example, the putting pressure on individual African countries to to change LGBT policy. I, you know, kind of I as an LGBT person, I support that, and I, you know, kind of and, you know, I also think that that you know that that anti LGBT sentiments in Africa don't, you know, kind of get enough condemnation as they should. Um, and so, but at the same time, I would also say that. That in a lot of ways, the way that the U.S. does things in its own backyard counts for a lot. So, for example, the way that the the, the Obama administration's um, uh, decision to to you know the one the, the time when they they projected the rainbow flag, if we stay with LGBT issues for the moment, the way that they projected the rainbow flag onto the the White House, that counted for for that was really a, a powerful gesture you know and it's that kind of powerful gesture that i think that i think has weight in africa so for example joining rejoining the paris uh, climate accord would be a massive step forward um for africa even though africa isn't directly involved in in that decision so so the us resuming some of its moral authority in the world i think would be very useful um at the same time i think one of one of the problems and this i think um Jude, we, we keep referencing Judah's article, and, and I think this this was particularly powerful. Is the the point that he made that that Europe, and I think this is this is somewhat true for the U.S. as well, is indifferent to African prosperity. I found that phrase very powerful, and and it's something that I really that I really think underlies a lot of where the West loses its influence in Africa. Because in the end, the, U, the, the West has no experience of, of systemic underdevelopment the way that Africa does and the way that China has had for, for a long time. That is a, a link between Africa and China that the, that the West finds difficult to, to get into because it, there's, a, there's a, a lapse of imagination there. Um, and, you know, for me... Again, like if the U.S. looks at at some of these lapses in its own backyard, I'm thinking of, for example, the water situation in Flint, Michigan. Um, that is a, a, an instance of systemic underdevelopment within U.S. with within the U.S. Um, and kind of you know addressing those and addressing those in a way that 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 kind of projects a, a universal, a global example, I think would be one one really crucial way of moving forward. What do you think? Well, in the context of the Chinese, I think there's also a big opportunity here, in part because Chinese uh, popularity and perceptions of Chinese influence on the continent uh, are going down, according to some of the data that we're starting to see out of Afrobarometer. All year, Afrobarometer has been releasing charts from their, their latest survey that they finished in 2019 and into 2020. And, and consider this, they just published a, a story today about perceptions of China's influence in Malawi. And in 2014, 59% of Malawians surveyed said that China's influence in economic activities was either some or a lot. Then in 2019, that number dropped to 36%. That is a precipitous drop. Uh, then also, the, the, the number of people who said they don't know about the influence of China's economic activities in Malawi 
uh, or refused to answer, interestingly, jumped from 19% to 41%. So that's a negative indicator as well. And I think there, we're seeing that data point across the continent that COVID-19 uh, has had a negative impact on Chinese perception. Also, the debt issue has had negative impacts as well. So if the United States or Europe or other players wanted to make a move, this might be the time in part because a lot of perceptions of the Chinese are in flux and have been going down. And also, let's not forget about what happened in April with the Guangzhou incident as well. That did not help Chinese public perception on the continent. So I think that if the United States can get a strategy that is... Uh, engaging, that is relevant, that is focused on jobs and practical issues. And I think that if they hold back a little bit on some of the more controversial civil political rights things, which is borders into some of the areas of lecturing that have shaped a lot of U.S. and European foreign policy in Africa for decades, and you have mentioned on a number of occasions how fed up people are across the continent of U.S. and European lecturing about these things. And that's one of the things that people like about China is they don't actually go on about, you know, these conditionalities on aid and also on governance issues. Again, good or bad, that's not the point that I'm trying to make here, but it is just the perceptions issues. What do you think about this moment in time that we're having right now in terms of declining Chinese public opinion? I think maybe, you know, it, I, I've been thinking a lot about how to interpret that. Um, w one of the one of the ways, I guess, one, one could look at it is that, in a way, China is maybe becoming more familiar um, as a as a, a, a presence in Africa, um, and that with that comes a kind of a necessary, you know, kind of normalization in a way of also its approval ratings. Um, you know, so 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 that that may maybe one point. I think I think the. The issue of the debt and and also the the perception that um, that China is you know a perception that that's fed by all of the secrecy around the debt. So the issue that that China that China is a massively powerful player on the continent, but one that that refuses to disclose exactly which game it's playing. Um, I think that is is damaging for 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 China, and it'll be interesting to see how the fallout around the debt um, and Zambia particularly is gonna is gonna impact that. Um, however, I think. I think at the same time, um, you know, the, 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 and this is something that we discuss frequently, but, but the, the Chinese development story in Africa um, is is a unique asset, you know the the exactly the issue of you know no one used to have you know, no one used to have access to water you know kind of forty years ago in China now everyone has access to water that kind of that kind of jump from from um, you know or, or a, a narrative where one can when one can chart the development of 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 common um, broad-based prosperity in China, that story is really, really valuable, I think, um, to, to, to Africans. Um, and, and it will go a long way, um, you know, to, to, to lose its power. Um, and so I think any kind of other partner, including the U.S., that's where they need to focus. Um, you know, they, they, they need to focus, as you mentioned, on jobs, for example, on on these on on really kind of nitty gritty, um, you know, everyday development issues. I think those those will will do a lot to to kind of to help to to lift that relationship. Well, that is some good advice, and I hope that some folks in the incoming administration at the State Department, the White House, the National Security Council, and the Pentagon are listening to your sage words. Uh, we're going to leave the conversation there. We've packed a lot in today, but the issue Issues that we've talked about in this particular show about Zambia, about public perceptions, all of that came out of actually just the past two days of our newsletter. And that's the kind of thing that we're putting into our newsletter. We're really excited about the fact that the community of readers is growing, and we would love for you, our podcast audience, who's gotten all the way to the end of the show, that means you are among the most loyal, to join us and, and check it out. Go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. Sign up. It's free to sign up. Get You'll get two weeks for free. See if you like it. If you don't like it, you can cancel any time. We'll give you your money back, but we think you will like it, and we'd love to have you part of our reader community. Once again, Again, that's chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. So that'll do it for this edition of the show. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another program. For Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash chinaafricaproject to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter. 
where you can find Gwobas at Studinsky or Eric at E. Orlander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.